Hi, welcome to the Real Estate Investing Made Simple Club. We do live interviews with experts and leaders in the real estate investing world. I'm Leanne Riley, real estate coach and broker, and I help people get started or scale a portfolio without confusion or fear with my proven profit formula coaching program. I built a $14 million portfolio in residential, multifamily, condo development, commercial, and vacation properties. And I lead the Encore Investment Team of Realtors in the Twin Cities. And here's Eric Jansen here. How you doing? He's part of the Encore Investment Team. Mm -hmm. And he's my assistant. I want you to check out my YouTube channel, Leanne Riley Real Estate, and be sure and subscribe. There's lots of educational material over there. Today, the topic is trending market and what's really happening in real estate. And Eric and I, we're active realtors. We're out there in the soup every day. Mm -hmm. And we're going to fill you in on what's going on, right, Eric? Yep, yep. And there's a lot. You know, people are asking us, what about the mortgage rates? How's that affecting the market? We'll cover that. We're going to cover inflation. What yep. else? Unemployment. Yep, unemployment. What makes the Midwest a good market? Mm -hmm. So hang on and you'll get all the clues so you can be a smart investor. We're going to talk real estate. So, Eric, you know, something new came out today on inflation, right? Mm -hmm. well, tell us about it. So the new inflation report came out for July and it was down. So that's good news. Um, last month for June, it was at 9.1%. This month for July, it was at 8.5%, which was actually lower than they expected. So good news. A big driver of that was gas prices. As most people, if you're driving around anywhere, you realize that gas prices are getting lower and lower. I, you know, now they're under four, at least around my house. So $4 a gallon. So that was a big driver. They said also uh, airline uh, prices were a big driver bringing it down. Fortunately, there's still a lot of things that are high, so it's not like where they want it to be, but it is uh, lower than expected and lower than last month. So hopefully we've hit the top and now we're hopefully coming down. Now, I have a question about that then, Eric. Does, you know, we've all this stuff about the recession that really isn't here. That's another indicator. It really, it's not coming. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. I know when I see gas, when I saw it below four bucks, boy, did I celebrate. But isn't that how, you know, the mortgage rates, it's kind of funny because now, oh my God, they're up to 6% or whatever they're up to, right? People worry, but really that's low. You have to really put that in perspective. That right. I bought things at 18% interest and didn't flinch. So put it in perspective, but this is good news that mm -hmm. the inflation number coming down because every month it went up. Is this the first down? No, it's not the first down, but they've been looking for where the peak is at. Okay. So they've been kind of saying, okay, it's going to peak now. It's going to peak now. And, and um, the one good thing that I take out of it is their projections that they've always had. So I watch this every single month and every single month they have a projection and then they come in above the projection. It's been like clockwork every single month. This month, they had a projection they were below. So that's good. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's making people more optimistic right now about where things are hopefully headed uh, as far as that direction. Then I was watching some information and looking up some information about interest rates. You know, the, the Fed meets again in September. They were looking at if inflation is going to keep on the rise. They were going to do another three quarter point hike or maybe a point. Now, maybe they'll soften that a little bit. Maybe there won't be as many increases. We'll have to see where inflation goes, but it's we're moving in the right direction finally. So that's the good news. So what I, I was asking Eric about, because you know we get this question as investment property realtors a lot, almost from every client. What's the market doing? Should I, you know, should I sell? Should I hold? What do I do? Um, I got on a call yesterday with a lady and, you know, she actually was from Canada. Should I sell or should I hold? And I learned a few things from her. They're a couple weeks behind us. She said the U.S. raises your interest rates. They raise their interest rates. Um, there's a real estate's different in different countries and different regions. 
we're strong in the Midwest and, you know, we look at economic indicators and there's another one, right? Mm -hmm. And that would be unemployment is another one you really want to look at. What What are we at? So for the U.S., we're at 3.5, which is very low. And for Minnesota, we're at 1.8, which is really low. I went back five years and it's the lowest it's been. So um, unemployment in Minnesota in this market is very low. So it's good. It's good. And even though when you go to the restaurant, there's, you know, they all have, they need help, right? Mm -hmm. And some places have to cut their hours. Lots of things are happening around not having enough people yet. And here we are with this really, really, really low rate. Mm -hmm. It's good for the economy to be that low. It, you know, there's another indicator and us being below national standards. That's another reason why investing here in this Midwest area is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any other stats here? No, that's pretty much it. We were just, I think we're going to discuss, we had our meeting like in May when we gave our market update. So how have we done? Were, yeah, you know, because right so <laughs> Eric and I did a whole hour presentation on trends mm-hmm. and we showed you some slides and talked about statistics and we're spot on. What has changed in the real estate market is the that nasty multiple offer and run as fast as you can. It's not it still can happen, but not nearly as much. We don't have to run as fast. Um, if you find the right property, you better get there, though. Don't lose out on the good one because y- y- you don't want to go out that night. You still have to do that. But it's not that crazy multiple offer, 30000 40000 over, sight on scene, all of that. It's not, ha- it's not like that. I was able to secure two off-market deals in the last like month mm-hmm. for clients. There's still a lot of off-market activity. And guess what? You have to know the right realtors. And who's that? That's us. Off-market stuff. There's so much traffic over there. It's amazing. I got a good story. Somebody I know made an offer on a piece of property. It was for short-term rental purposes. And, you know, after the inspection, it was a big gulp. That's the longest inspection report I've ever seen. Really, really, really thorough and enough to make you go, Ah, not so much, but guess what? The particular agent had a different off-market opportunity and that's now under contract. So work with good agents, folks, makes a difference if you're Mm -hmm. out there shopping. Now, what about if you're thinking about selling your house? What have we seen change there? Um, I would say that pricing it right is very important. Um, we've seen a lot, lot more price drops recently than we've seen before. Um, my belief on that is I think a lot of homeowners and agents got a little bit too aggressive with how things were trending there, that they priced a little too high and it's caused some, you know, agents and and owners to have to drop their price some. So still a seller's market, still not enough uh, inventory. Uh, so if you have a house you're looking to sell, it's still, you know, as if it's priced right, it'll sell quick. Uh, But we're not seeing, like you said, the 20 multiple offer kind of situation like we saw before, but still definitely a seller's market with low inventory. Another issue I ran into recently was if you're on the lower end of the market and you're selling something in the, let's say, 200 range, 220 to up to 250, probably. I have seen, you know, this is the area where these higher interest rates are bumping people out of the market. Mm -hmm. Let's say they were qualified for an FHA loan and maybe some first time homebuyer money. And now the interest rate bumped up all this. They used to be able to do 250. Now they're at 220. And your choices at 220 are pretty slim and deals are falling apart. And that's why you see a lot of back on the market don't you see a lot more back on the market here deals Mm -hmm. are going south because of the people who are buying at the peak of what they could but i also ran into first time in several years low appraisal on a property now we're masters of i call it duct taping the deal together and i got that thing to the closing table and it was pretty amazing the 
yeah, we had to pay, the buyer had to pay over that low appraisal, but that appraisal was wrong. And as realtors, we can't argue with an appraisal, the lender can. The lender, if one comes in low, can prove or ask for a review, or there's a few things they can do. We don't really get to talk to appraisers. Sometimes we do, but not, we can't like call them. So um, that one did not get modified, but we still stapled the deal together. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're seeing that in the, you know, um, inventory isn't going to suddenly change here. Just know that it's not just right now. It's going to take, I, I read this somewhere three, four, five years before we could ever catch up. And the problem is we may not catch up because because of the pandemic, the building kind of stopped. It was actually too slow before that to keep up with the population, but then it got stuck with the lumber prices and the everything else. Our catch up time, it's far out folks. So that again is another opportunity to there's, there's buying deals out there. I don't care how, uh, what the prices are. There's deals out there always, if you know what you're looking for. And that's the thing, you gotta know your numbers. Don't buy the wrong thing. And that's the other thing working with us, we're going to point out things we see if we're standing in a property and we see something, we have realtor radar, we're going to at least like, wow, what's that over there just enough to bring up at least a question. Because we'd rather know now before we ever write the offer if we can notice that there, hey, we went, I went in a house and the toilet was in the closet. <laughs> the bedroom closet. It's like, okay, I think I see a red flag over there, folks. You know, what are we going to, how are you going to solve that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a good rental or, you know, with the toilet in the closet. They were solving the not enough bathroom issue, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and put them in the chat box there and we'll answer your real estate questions since you got us here live. I'm glad you're staying on, so you must be paying attention. So go ahead and ask us anything about the market. Excuse me, you know that's over there. Right? Yeah, I got the chat over here. Somebody must have one. What else? Let's see here. I had great questions for our financial planner. Oh, I know. I want to say some, I got something to talk about. I want to, Hey, couple of things. It's my birthday today. Happy birthday. Hey, <laughs> so that's a good one. Hey, thanks Renee. Happy birthday is right. Um, so guess what? I've been goofing off today. Just ask Eric, Bear, how have you been here? <laughs> I think I'm going to go to lunch. Oh, I think I'm, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, and isn't that what real estate's about is creating a job or a business, passive income, something that you can be free and have your own hours. So I just want to remind everybody, this is about real freedom now. That's why almost all of you people are investing in real estate. It's to get to that place of the passive income. And really, it's a matter of knowing which strategy fits my lifestyle and will get me there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I love like I see Renee is on here and she says I deserve to have fun. And she and Dean deserve to have fun, too, because you know what? They built a big portfolio of over 50 units and they work hard. And a lot of sweat equity, as we all talk about sweat equity and managing the properties yourself. That's not always easy. Renee had to learn it from scratch. And they, who knows how many apartments they painted and fixed up on those turns. But now they're finally over a little bit to that other side. Last time I called her up, I, don't, I forget, where were they? Aruba or... You know, she answered the phone too. I was surprised, but they were off on a vacation, which is what this is about. So I want you to remember to have that, have that goal in mind and, you know, work on different ways to get there. Like 
one of my good friends gave me for my birthday and I, it, she ordered it for me. It's a book called 369. What you do, it's how to manifest. You figure out what it is you want. I want to have, uh, make a million dollars in real estate or whatever the number, whatever it is. And you write it down three times in the morning, six times in the middle of the day and nine times at lunch. At, at dinner or I mean nighttime so three six nine and that gets your break first you see, obviously you say it outside but you have to write it out in longhand not on the computer because that gets your brain to turn on a different spot that helps bring it to you and I teach a lot about mindset because you know what you have to have a good mindset for real estate investing yeah mm -hmm. yeah you got to have good. I think Renee had a question. Oh, Renee, you got a question? What is it? Go further down or up or whatever. I got to go up. What about multifamily values? They're pretty strong and they're staying strong. I mean, that multifamily pricing has changed a lot in the last year and it's gone up and it's holding. You know, it again, multifamily, four units, eight units, whatever, 12, even duplex. Um, it's also based on the rent. Like how much rent can that piece of property get? And that's the good news too. The job market, the inflation, all of that are vacancy rates. Do you know what they are? I don't, but they're really low. I they're know. really, really low. I think they're 3% or less. And, you know, they're low. Low vacancy means we don't have enough rental units. So that pushes the rate up. And if you look at that trending out, it's it's strong. It's going to stay low. Again, we don't have enough housing for renters or for people to buy. You know, the pandemic changed things too. The part about people can live anywhere now and work remote. And, you know, that wasn't a possibility three years ago. All of our mentalities changed from the pandemic. And there, you're seeing a lot more articles about that. The workforce has changed. The employers have had to adapt. They're like forced to, or people will leave because they can go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So multifamily values are, are, are strong and staying strong is what I see. And like if you look at the uptown area, I read an article recently about that. And yes, they have higher crime things. If you're trying to sell something down there, it tends to take a little longer because mm -hmm. some people are afraid of the rebuilding, but it's starting to happen. And in the end, three years, five years from now, we're going to actually have an improved area. That That's something to keep in mind. Oh, good. Somebody gave us a really long question here. <laughs> Wait, I got to go up to the top. Okay, Kayla says, I'm considering wholesaling some properties as a means to an end to achieve financial freedom with the end goal of holding long and short-term properties. You know, oh, there's more. There. Oh, there, is there more? No, let's, any suggestings on achieving this? Yeah, I do. You know, one thing I always tell people about wholesaling, wholesaling is a marketing business. As long as you understand that, then maybe you have some skills in that arena or you're willing to go over there. It's not really the real estate business. Yes, you're marketing to people in real estate, but it is a, you have to come up with, you know, First, you got to find the property somehow, but really, once you find it, if you're going to wholesale it, you have to know your numbers to know you got to buy it at the or get it under contract at the right amount. Or I get so many wholesale deals across my desk. The numbers don't work. It's like, yeah, so but you have to spend money on marketing to be able to get the properties and then even have a way to market to the cash buyers. because. It's kind of a timely game, that wholesaling. I would say if you master that marketing, though, if you can master that wholesaling business and get good at it, especially with low inventory, you're talking three, four, five years down the road, um, that can set you up to be able to get other deals. You have 
options then to get deals where some other people might not. So it's, if you can master it, it's definitely a way to further your investing career and further your investments, your portfolio moving forward. So totally. And I do, I think too, Kayla, it is a good way to build a portfolio. I do know people who they maybe not wholesaling, but they do a fix and flip make enough money, maybe 30 to 100,000, depending on how smart they are, they make enough to then put the down payment on that next buy and hold. Then they go out and do another flip to make some more of that down payment in a quicker manner. Right, it's combining those strategies. It's, it's combining strategies that gets you to the end goal, like you said, financial freedom faster. Another one we see is in today in my Proven Profit Formula coaching program, we do an hour and a half of private coaching when you're in the program as a group. And today we did a deal review on a short-term rental. And why I bring this up is because short-term rentals, the money can be more than a regular long-term rental. But there's a but. <laughs> There's always a but in real estate. You've got, you know, now you've got cleaning, different kinds of insurance. You've got to book it. you got to share your money with Airbnb or whoever it is. You know, there's a lot more. Now you're running a business much like wholesale. It's a whole nother business, but it's a lot different than just buying something, getting hiring a property manager so you don't have to do the work and then the tenant's there and you don't get a phone call. Big difference. I would say, too, if you're going to do short term rentals is pay close attention to the city rules and county rules and um, all that kind of stuff, because each city can change on the fly. And and then you're kind of like, OK, so you have that backup plan, you know, know you can rent it. You know, if if short term rental gets squashed in your city, you can rent it. Yeah. Normally. Plan B. Yeah. Well, and that just happened. You just sold a house in... Yeah, it wasn't a short-term rental, but I had sold a house in Maple Grove for an investor. And then there was a rent moratorium in Maple Grove. And luckily, he got in right before that. But, you know, right now in Maple Grove, if you're going to buy a, a townhouse or a single family home, you can't get a renter's license until next year at the earliest. Right now, they've got a moratorium until next July to get a renter's license. Now, if you're doing you know, duplex, you know, multifamily, triplex, fourplex, you can still get a renter's license, but it's anything single family and townhouse, you can't, unless you already have one, you can't get one now. So, so wait a minute, know, if I bought one that's already been being rented out, can I? Well, if hopefully you have a renter's license, if you bought one that's already rented out. So if you have a current renter's license in Maple Grove, you can continue. If you don't, and you buy a property now and you want to rent it, when you close, you won't be able to until next year. So just know that if you're buying single family or townhouses in Maple Grove, that's uh, something that can happen. So just paying attention to that in, in any market you're going to buy in. That's why you need realtors who are on it, because we only found out that just right, you know, during his deal, we found that out. And we're like, it was actually Whoa. after it closed. Oh, OK. It closed, it closed like two days and then found out about that. But luckily, he was able to get in. He had until the end of that month to get his license, renter's license, and everything's fine. So, um, but yeah, it's something that you definitely want to pay attention to. And sometimes like that, they didn't really like broadcast it out there. All of a sudden, it just hit out into social media that, hey, they have a, a moratorium on rentals in Maple Grove, and it just went through. So, yeah. Okay, we got another question. And this, do you have any markets, zip codes within Minnesota or the Midwest to stay out of war zone areas? Boy, now this is, I can't answer that question because this is exactly like the financial planner and what happened to him. We, realtor, licensed realtors, we cannot tell you, um, we cannot steer, they call it, we can't steer you away from the war zone. Now, what I can say, though, is there is on the Internet, and I forget the new site, it's the Minneapolis it's Police. Like crime data. I think. Crime data, Minneapolis yeah. Crime data. Minneapolis crime data. You can go on whatever city's website and Google around for the crime stats, and you can look them all up on a map mm -hmm. by zone, so you can figure this out yourself. 
So try that out. Um, yeah, and that is so important about where you're going to buy. Um, we were just working on um, some promotional material, I'll call it, and that location, location, location never, ever, ever goes away. And you need to buy in appreciating areas where something new and exciting is going on. Like if you're in a short-term rental, he nailed it. You better have some sort of tourist attraction. You can't have a short-term. Oh yeah, you write up, wrote an offer on one sixty miles or whatever north of Duluth, oh, west, yeah. Yeah. west of Duluth. Kind Just, of a ways away. It wasn't a lake though, but it was on a lake. It was a gorgeous property. He wrote an offer this week, but guess what? It was it, it was, was an hour away from hour anything. away from Duluth, out in the middle of nowhere. Like mm -hmm. how many Airbnb are you going to attract to this 60 miles from Duluth inland? What, what's your draw? There was no big town nearby. There was no, you know, gorgeous place though, you guys. But I don't know. I, if, unless that was already an Airbnb and I had a proven track record, then I might do it. Or if I won't, you know, if I was going to use it for, personal use that's different second home something but uh -huh. you have to look at um particularly with those short-term rentals you got to have a draw it's got to be and then you got to have a backup plan you got to have a backup plan can, can you get, that rug can get pulled off from money at any time yeah I had him pull up every single city like we were mm -hmm. we were probably outdated by now. Oh, it is. We were mapping. <laughs> he he had to go on every city site, call the city, all that. So we had a whole scope of what cities can you do short term rentals in. Yeah. And it's changing by the yeah, that, was, that was over six months ago. So it's probably yeah. not the same anymore. So I like this. Renee says, make sure to contact the police department in that area as well. That's brilliant. She knows that one really well. If you're going to buy a rental, you can call the police department and ask them how many calls has this place had? You know, sometimes you might have to actually go in. They might not tell you, but I know in Hennepin County, you can get a crime report. If you call the police department, and let's say you're going to inherit a couple tenants. Maybe you want to check before you buy the property in that due diligence period, that inspection period. Maybe you want to check. Good idea. Because, you know, sometimes you don't get told everything, right? And if, there, if you had a problem person, you might reconsider or at least when is their lease done and how might that work for you? Oh, the chat's got more. I mean, it should. Q and A. Q and A. Are we missing something? No. Uh, let's see here. This oh, I got to move it down. Six. There we go. We got some questions. As realtors, are you accustomed to working with people who are wholesaling properties and keeping some rentals? Yes. I work with a lot of people who wholesale properties. Um, like I said, in fact, I. I found the buyer for the property they were wholesaling. Um, like it, we'll look at wholesale deals all day long, won't we? Because mm -hmm. we have cash buyers and regular buyers for fixer uppers all day long. So that'd be my answer to that is, but not all realtors, some realtors still today say, you can't, th that's illegal wholesaling that's not true at all but you need someone who actually understands what it is and how it works and how to write the paperwork on something like that because lots of realtors different yeah they don't understand it so you do want to work with somebody who knows now your question though accustomed to working with people who are wholesaling properties and then keeping some as rentals absolutely if you're a wholesaler you keep the good guys right <laughs> It's yeah. just like when multifamily people are going to uh, maybe liquidate some of their portfolio. It's only natural. You sell your worst ones first, right? And you keep the best ones. That's natural. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And you know what? That's another tip. I remember one time I, um, I was buying like a 12-unit apartment building. 
And sitting at the closing table with that seller, I just said, hey, do you have any other buildings you're thinking of selling? And he said, you know, I have some, but he likes to find his next project first. So guess what? He phoned me when he was ready to sell them. I bought 17 unit and another 12 unit from that same seller. You got to ask. Okay, we got another. Any advice on non-conventional Fannie Freddie lending options in which the down payment and debt to income requirements would be less stringent? Okay, I got to think out loud on that one. Non-conventional. Okay, so lending options. So we're non-conventional. Okay, down payment and the the one that where I have seen. On a second home purchase, you can get 10% down. Now, if you're going to Airbnb, people do that often. That's how they finance it. So it's not an investment property. It's your second home is what you're saying. Yep. And they now we're realtors. That's not our department. I can't give mortgage advice, but I've seen it done. Let's right. put it that way. Right. <laughs> okay, because we're not mortgage people. Okay, and yes, commercial loans are good for investment property. And here's the other thing. If you know what you're doing in this business, I did many commercial loans on even a duplex and got the fix-up money along with the purchase price. And you can do it even without no money out of my pocket. But you got to be a sophisticated investor for that. And there's people in my program doing that. Takes so, you know, like we said, it's combining strategies that makes money faster and gets you to the passive income. Um, this person also asked about, you know, the debt to income requirements less than stringent you know debt to income banks they still are going to look for that de debt to income ratio mm -hmm. even on the commercial loans and sometimes i was just advising someone the other night sometimes that's where you need a partner who can some you know maybe your wife has better credit standing on their own or sometimes you have to find a partner with better financial picture and maybe you're the one out there doing all the work but they have a better financial picture and that sometimes is a good partnership yeah i've worked with investors like that where there's the one year i was dealing with is not the person that's in charge of the money there's a money person in the background that you don't even really know they're even there yeah and the investors out front and you're working with them and then when you go to write the deal you find out that the financing and everything comes from somebody else. else. And those people, lots but of times. they time, have an LLC together. Right. They have an LLC together <laughs> and they have whatever arrangement they have. Sometimes I've seen that where it's maybe the parents are, you know, backing the child, adult child, and together they're investing, that kind of thing. I see that often. That's an interesting one. What's our question? Would you consider discussing underwriting deals, analyzing the ARV, and in general, analyzing a deal? Well, I, yeah, um, I might. If you, one place, um, we do do deal reviews on in my proven profit formula, but there's one really great class here in town, just so you know, Pine Financial puts on that Sean Blumkiss teaches it at the library. He does it every couple of weeks. So if you're thinking about um, buying a wholesale deal and you need hard money, that's who Pine Financial is. They really have a great couple hour class where he just really takes you through how they figure out the ARV and what numbers work. What, what do they as hard money lenders look for in a deal? And of course they like experienced people, but they do help first time real estate people who are doing that they just they're conservative they got to cover their own underwriting and their own but it's great to go to one of those classes and learn how they have a great youtube channel too they I really do minria for wholesaling too yeah 
Henria is a good place. Yeah. Um, look at, we took a whole 30 minutes already. I can't, <laughs> I said, we'll go on for a couple minutes, Eric, and we'll just chat with some people. So um, I think we answered everything. And if we, if you guys want to stay on a network, I'm going to like invite you in. I'll stop the recording. And then it's just, you can, if you're looking for a deal or something, go ahead and tell us. And then, you know, you might meet somebody here in the meeting. I've had people meet in this meeting and go on. So I'm going to change us. I'm just going to stop recording here.